In today's lecture, we will establish some electromagnetic theorems that will be very important in this course. And they are general results we get by manipulating Maxwell's equations without reference to any particular coordinate system or type of boundary conditions. So we begin thinking about the flow of power in an electromagnetic field. You know, the electric field has units of volts per meter. And the magnetic field has units of amps per meter. So a product, EH of some form, will have units of volts times amps, but that's watts, and then per square meter. We call that an intensity. Or in optics, we might call it a brightness. The intensity or brightness of the field. Watts per square meter. Power density. Power per unit area. Now, what kind of products can we have between vectors? Well, we know about a dot product. That produces a scalar. And we know about a cross product. That produces a vector. And since power in a, an electromagnetic field, of course, is something that flows through space at the speed of light in that particular medium, we would expect that power flow would be represented by a vector. So it would have a direction, the direction of power flow, and a an magnitude, which would give this intensity. So that suggests that we would look at E, say, cross H, or something related to that. This may be somehow representing power flow. Let's go back and look at a vector identity that we established previously, which is that the divergence of the cross product of two vectors, and we'll take those to be E and H conjugate, can be written as H conjugate dot the curl of E minus E dot the curl of H conjugate. Now, why do we conjugate this one term? Uh, well, we'll see as we go along. If we can substitute in for these curl relationships, uh, we may end up getting field vectors, in this case, unconjugated field vectors times this conjugated field vector, that may give us an h squared term. And over here, we may get a conjugated field vector times the e. And if that's an e conjugate times e, that'll give us an e squared. And we know that, for example, 1 half sigma e squared represents the density of power absorbed by a conducting medium, watts per cubic meter. Now, whenever we see a curl of one of the field vectors, we immediately can think of one of the Maxwell's equations that have a curl in them. So we have Faraday's law that says the curl of E is equal to minus j omega mu, and we will allow for complex permeability, so mu c times h. And for the curl of h, we'll have Ampere's law. The curl of H is equal to J, and we'll just pull out just the impressed current because we will include conduction current in a complex permittivity, epsilon C, and then that times E. Now we need the curl of H conjugate. So the J is conjugated, the E is conjugated, the complex permittivity is conjugated, and this J here being conjugated makes this a minus. So we substitute now these curl relations in, in up here into our identity, and we get the divergence of E cross H conjugate is equal to H conjugate dot subbing in for curl of E, we got minus j omega mu c 
h, right? And there's where we're going to get our h conjugate dot h, which will just be magnitude of h squared. And then we've got minus e dot the curl of h conjugate is this here, j impressed conjugated minus j omega epsilon complex conjugated e conjugate. And then we'll, we will get our e dot e conjugate. So that is equal to, here we've got minus j omega mu c h squared. That just means the magnitude of h squared, h conjugate dot h. And let's see, over here, then we're going to have, um, minus minus j so that would be plus j omega epsilon c conjugate e dot e conjugate so that's e squared and then we've got minus e dot j impressed conjugate and this we've seen previously uh, one half the real part of that represents the work done by the electric field on the impressed currents. Now we've got a divergence on the left. We can apply the divergence theorem and convert that into a surface integral. So we can write that the integral over some enclosed volume of the divergence of E cross H conjugate dV is equal to the integral on the closed bounding surface of E dot H conjugate dot ds, the flux of whatever that thing is through the surface. And since this has units of watts per square meter, that integrated over a surface should have a value in watts. So maybe this represents the flow of power through that surface. All right, so that would be integrating over all volume the left side, converting it to a surface integral, and that would be equal to the integral over the volume of the right side. And so we would have that this would be equal to the integral over the volume of the right side minus j omega mu c h squared plus j omega epsilon c conjugate e squared minus e dot j impressed conjugate, that whole thing integrated over the enclosed volume. So, uh, because this has units of watts, the, each one of these terms should have units of watts also. So this might be some representation of the conservation of power. So let's try to figure out which each of these terms represent. So let's break this up and and rewrite that this is equal to each of these three terms here. So we have the integral over the closed surface that bounds some volume of E cross H conjugate dot ds. And then we have three terms on the right, break up those into three separate integrals. The integral over that volume of E dot J impressed conjugate dV minus the integral over the volume of J omega mu complex, and we'll write that out explicitly as mu prime minus j mu double prime, and that was times h squared dv, and then a similar term, 
but with a plus sign because of the conjugation. Integral over the volume, j omega epsilon complex conjugate. So that would be epsilon prime plus j epsilon double prime due to the conjugation times z e squared dv. Now, again, as we said, all, each one of these terms has units of power. And we know that uh, this, well, at least one half, the real part of this product represents the power per unit volume of the work uh, done by the electric field on the impressed currents. So let's do the following. Let's take, move all terms to the left hand side and let's take one half the real part of each of those because we know that one half the real part of this we know that, that physically what that means so let's do that to all the terms so on the left we would have the integral over the surface one half the real part of E cross H conjugate dot ds and this this guy now we're going to move over to the other side so the minus becomes a plus plus the integral over the volume of one half the real part of e dot impressed current conjugate dv let's see up here in this term we'll here here we'll have a minus j times mu prime well that'll be imaginary so with the real part we'll get rid of that but then we'll have minus j times minus j minus minus is plus j times j is minus one so we have minus omega mu double prime move it to the other side it'll become plus omega mu double prime so we'll have plus the integral over the volume of one half omega mu double prime h squared dv and then for this term See, we'll have j omega epsilon. That'll be imaginary. That goes away. Then we'll have j times j is minus 1 omega epsilon double prime. Move it to the other side. It becomes a plus. So we'll have plus the integral over the volume of 1 half omega epsilon double prime e squared dv. Now, we can recognize omega epsilon double prime as the conductivity or the equivalent conductivity at frequency omega. And likewise, we defined omega mu double prime to be the magnetic conductivity such that one half sigma e squared is the dissipated power per unit volume due to electric conductivity and one half Sigma m h squared is the dissipated uh, power loss due to magnetic conductivity. We finally end up with this expression. The integral over the surface, one half the real part of E cross h conjugate dot ds plus the integral over the volume of one half the real part of E dot J impressed conjugate dV plus the integral over the volume and now we'll combine these two conduction terms of one half sigma m h squared plus one half sigma e squared dv. Well, that all needs to add up to zero because we moved all the terms over to the left-hand side. And they all have units of power. So it's the sum of powers is equal to zero. Well, we have the conservation of energy. The sum of all energy changes in any system as long as you include all energy changes, has to be equal to zero. Energy has to be conserved. And 
Likewise, since energy has to be conserved at all times, power, which is the rate of change of energy, the total power must be zero. In other words, any power that's dissipated someplace must come and be generated somewhere else. So there's a power balance. And that's what this is expressing. And we know what this is. This is um, power from field to the impressed current. That's the work done by the electric field on the impressed current. And we know what this is. Power dissipated by conduction, either magnetic or electric. So this is power being taken out of the electromagnetic field and dissipated as uh, basically heat through conduction. This is power being taken out of the electromagnetic field and transferred to the current. And that must add to this term to give zero. So what does that term represent? Let's see, let's just kind of sketch this out here. Here's your, your volume V and your surface S. This we know has units of power. There's maybe some power, imagine power flowing out the surface like that. Uh, this has units of, right, so if this is the electric field and this is the impressed current, the dot product of, of this with the conjugate of that, one half the real part of that is the time average power transferred from the electric field to that current from the work done, E dot J. And then we've got these, uh, different conduction losses over here. And the sum of all those have to be zero. So the conduction losses can never be negative, of course, because of the, these things are, the sigmas are, can be zero or positive, but not negative. And of course, H squared and E squared can never be negative. So this can be never be, never be negative. It can only be positive. And therefore, if one of these terms is positive, the other must be negative. For example, if, let's say this term is positive, that the electric field is doing, on average, work on the impressed currents, well then, this term must be negative, meaning power must actually be being uh, flowing in through that surface. So that would tell us that this term here must represent power flowing out of the surface. And that leads us to define that integrand to be a vector which we denote by P called the pointing vector and this is one half the real part E cross H conjugate it is the time average power per unit area directed power per unit area in the field or the time average directed intensity watts per square meter the direction of it is the direction of power flow, right? So if there's a if there's a particular pointing vector here, that means that's the direction that power is flowing. Notice because it's E cross H conjugate, it's perpendicular to both E and H. So that's a right angle, and that's a right angle. E and H don't necessarily may be or may not be perpendicular to each other, but this flow of power is perpendicular to both E and H. Now, um, by the way, if we take this term and we put a negative sign in front of it, well, power from transferred from the field to the current is negative power transferred from the current to the field. So that if we put a minus there, this would rep be representing power uh, transferred from this impressed current to the field. And so that would be another point of view. If we turn that around and put a minus sign, then we could imagine currents here that are putting power into the field, and that power put into the field could go into conduction losses or into power that flows through the surface and out to infinity. Okay, so this is Poynting's theorem.
for our purposes, uh, working in the phasor domain, it's that one half the real part of E cross H conjugate represents the time average intensity, directed intensity. So it's got a direction and a magnitude uh, of the electromagnetic field. Now, Maxwell's equations, Faraday's law, curl V equal to minus J omega mu H, mu can be complex there, and Ampere's law, the curl of H is equal to J plus J omega epsilon, which can be complex, times E. Those have an infinite number of solutions all poss physically possible electromagnetic fields that can exist in any possible environment. So in a particular problem, of course, we want to have one particular solution to Maxwell's equations. Yet Maxwell's equations permits an infinite number of solutions. So we are going to need some additional constraints in order to pick out a single unique solution. And this leads to the conditions that are called the uniqueness theorem. So let's imagine that we have some closed surface bounding, bounding a volume. And within that, there are some impressed currents sources here, J impressed. Maybe we have an, some antennas or something inside there. And this material has permeability mu c, which could be a function of position, could be an inhomogeneous material, and epsilon c, which also could be a function of position. And that's that material inside that surface. Now, suppose for that source and these constitutive parameters, we come up with two different solutions. We come up with a solution that has electric field E1 and magnetic field H1, and another solution, E2 and H2. What we want to see is what conditions can we impose to guarantee that E1 is equal to E2 and H1 is equal to H2. In other words, that this solution must be unique. Any two solutions we have must be the same solution. Well, let's write out Maxwell's equations. We'll do it for E1 first, and H1, H1, and there's J impressed, and that's E1. And then we'll do it for the second set of field vectors, E2, minus J omega mu, and this could be complex, let's put that explicitly, times H2, the curl of H2 is equal, we have the same sources, and the same constitutive parameters, but now presumably different field vectors. So let's subtract the second from the first. What do we get? Well, we're going to get the curl of E1 minus the curl of E2. Well, that's the curl of E1 minus E2. And so let's define delta E to be the difference E1 minus E2. And delta H to be the difference H1 minus H2. So the deltas are the differences of the fields. So this will become the curl of delta E will be equal to, over here you'll have H1 minus H2, which will be, so we'll get minus j omega mu c delta h. Now how about for Ampere's law? Well here you'll have the difference of the curls and that'll be the curl of the difference, differences, of the difference, sorry, curl of delta h. Now the impressed currents are the same in both, so when you subtract that goes away and that leaves then, that's complex, j omega epsilon complex delta E. So notice that the differences of the fields satisfy the source-free version of Maxwell's equations.
Now, let's go back and apply, therefore, the uh, conditions we had for Poynting's theorem. And that was that the integral over the bounding surface of one half the real part of E cross H conjugate, in this case that would be delta E cross delta H conjugate dot ds is equal to, well there's no, in this these difference equations, there's no impressed current, so there's no impressed current term. Uh, so that plus the integral over the volume of one half um, sigma m delta h squared plus one half sigma delta e squared dv has to be equal to zero because again this these equations have no source term no no current term and now let's see what happens if this is equal to zero if that surface integral vanishes what do we get over here well these are non-negative and let's assume also that sigma m greater than zero and sigma greater than zero throughout the volume well if that's true this has got to be if this is zero then this has got to be zero because they sum to zero and this is non-negative so the only way this can be zero is if the integrand is zero everywhere and if sigma m and sigma are not zero then the only thing that can satisfy that is that delta e the magnitude of that meaning the difference of the fields and delta h must be zero everywhere in the volume in other words they must be the same the two original fields e1 and e2 must be the same fields because delta e is the difference of them delta h is the difference of the h vectors so apparently if this surface integral can be set to zero and if we have lossy material then we're guaranteed that the two field vectors are identical for the two solutions so let's think about the conditions under which this could be zero and let's just imagine a little surface patch which we'll take to be oriented in the z direction so a hat z times the area ds and so we've got right a delta e and a delta h here and so this this cross product dot ds is going to be well dot the z, a z hat that means it's going to pull out the z component of the cross product so what is delta e cross delta h conjugate dot a hat z the z component of it well the z component of a cross product is the x component of the first so that's delta e x times the y component of the second that's delta h conjugate y minus the y component of the first that's delta e y times the x component of the second that's delta a uh, delta h uh, x conjugate and so if that is equal to zero then this integrand will be equal to zero but notice uh, this, this involves ex ey hx and hy those are the tangent components because the normal component is the z component the other two components are the tangent components so if here's one way to satisfy that if delta ex is equal to delta ey is equal to zero or delta hx is equal to delta hy is equal to zero then oops then this is equal to zero and what does that mean what delta ex equals delta ey equals zero that means if 
the tangential components of E are, are the same, or the tangential components of H are the same, then E1 is equal to E2, and H1 is equal to H2. So if it, at everywhere on this surface, the tangential component of either E or H is the same for the two fields, meaning the difference is equal to zero, then the two fields must be the same throughout the entire volume. And that is the uniqueness theorem. Sorry for my handwriting there. And another way to specify it then, it tells us what we need in order to specify a unique solution of Maxwell's equations. So it tells us that for given sources, impressed current, and mu c and epsilon c, which can be functions of position, solution is unique if tangential components of E or one or the other, or both, E or H, are specified on the boundary S. And that's what we need for a unique solution.